What is going on, guys? It is Thursday night, so it is the CBSI Bolo Show. I do apologize. This is recorded tonight. It's not live. So we are happy that you are joining us right now in the live chat for the premiere. Really, really thankful for that. But I am going out of town with my family Join the day in Hershey Park this weekend. And Jack's holding it down in the chat right now. So make sure he'll be answering any questions you guys might have. But I'm sorry that I'm missing all those great conversations that always go on in the chat. But with me right now is my host, Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. What's going on, bud? Oh, man, not a whole lot. Excited to be here, Brian. This is a, I talk about this every week. This is my favorite time of the week, the CBSI Bolo Show. And whether it's pre-recorded or whether it's live, either way, we are going to bring the fire. And as you mentioned, I'm in the chat right now. So if anybody wants to reach out, get with me. Um, be happy to answer any questions and just talk comics. Right. So I will say we will be back live next Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern, regular scheduled time, and live instead of a premiere. But if you want to, also... We do have the podcast version available, so if you want to listen to this on your commute instead of watching it on YouTube, it's available on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and we do have a sponsor for this show. It's Nick Dortman at SlabbedHeroes.com. Fantastic. Guarantee 9.8 on Modern Comics. Great prices. Not only does he sell graded comics, but he also sells raw comics, so if you're looking for raw comics at a great price, he even has his own exclusives right now, so make sure you check out those variants, but... He's also done something else for us, hasn't he, Jack? Oh, yeah, yeah. Re real, really appreciate what he did for us this week, a uh, little new feature to the Patreon group. Right, so up on the screen right now, there is a special area on his website for Simple Man's Comics Patreon members. You have to be a Patreon member to see these exclusive sale items, so really appreciate that with Nick. And Simple Man's Comics Patreon members have definitely been appreciating that. Because they've been talking about some of the deals that they've been getting, right, Jack? Oh, yeah. The prices are unreal. Um, I can't give anything away for you guys because you got to be a member of the Simplemans Comics Patreon family. But I'm telling you, the prices are unreal. We're talking signature series books. We're talking 9.8s, 9.6s. Just some incredible stuff at unreal prices. So we appreciate Nick for all he's done for our Simplemans Comics family. Right. And while we're talking about the Patreon, I will say right now there are still a few slots open for... The Mystery Bolo Box. If you go to uh, if you go to patreon.com forward slash simple man's comics, you can sign up there. Multiple tiers. I believe there's one of the premium and a couple of the regular monthly boxes available, as well as a bunch of other tiers. All those all those tiers help support this show, support this channel. So huge shout out to everyone that is a Patreon member. Really appreciate it. And enough talking about all that stuff. We are gonna get into the Bolo Rewind from last week. So the big books last week right now, Jack, I would say one that's probably the hottest would be Captain Marvel number eight. Yeah, definitely. That was that was the clear winner of the week last week. Um, and uh, we may see that theme continue this week. But Captain Marvel number eight came with the first appearance of Star, came out of left field. Everyone was expecting issue nine or issue ten. Um got kind of like that late word around Monday, Tuesday, that this would be happening. First, we thought it was going to be a cameo. It's definitely a first full appearance. And we're still seeing demand for this issue stay solid. Um, you know, in near mint condition, you're looking at sales of cover A for $20 to $25, some as high as $30. Uh, pretty similar pricing for the um, carnageized variant, which is just an incredible looking variant. Um, selling for around $20. Um, 25, and then the incentive variant, the 125 incentive selling for around $90 in near mint condition. I've seen even very fine condition books selling over ratio for about 60 to $70. Really incredible. People are going all in on this first appearance. Um, it's definitely, definitely been a sight to see. And then of course, unknown comics, as well as a couple of their partners released a virgin cover of the carnage variant. And that book is going for about $40 shipped right now. So the demand across the board has been really solid for Captain Marvel number eight, the clear winner of last week. Right. And if you watched last night's premiere of a hot and cold list, which is also available on replay right now, this was actually Dan Piercy who writes the reading pile article for comicbookinvest.com. This was his hot pick as well, Captain Marvel in general. This one, and also he was highlighting that Walmart art germ exclusive for issue number one. So definitely everyone's well aware of Captain Marvel right now. The question will be, is it sustainable and where it's going to go with this character, right? Yeah. 
Definitely, definitely. You know, it's always tough with a new character. But the, the market in general is so bullish on moderns right now. There's a real modern madness going on. And anytime a new character pops, it just seems like people are jumping all over it. And, um, you know, FOMO the puppet had to come out and even speak on this one because prices are just going insane. Right. Then another book in the recap that was kind of overshadowed but still has some buzz around it was Silver Surfer Black number two, right? Especially the variant for this. Right, yeah. You have the first appearance of the Void Knight. Not really sure if this is a character that's going to be a long-term play, um, but that got the buzz going. And more than that, people really love the cover art of that 1 in 25 variant. So, you know, you look at the prices of the 125 variant, it has dropped a bit. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me, but uh, prices are um, sitting around thirty to forty dollars, and it really depends on the condition of that book. That, that all white cover, uh, diamond shipping boxes have not been friendly to it. So you know, if it's a near mint minus, it's going around thirty. If it's near mint to near mint plus, you can actually get forty five, maybe even fifty dollars for it. Um, so it, that's a real condition sensitive book. A real bolo though is cover A and cover B. They kind of got slept on last week. Um, they, they sold out, they're t tough to find, but I, a lot of dealers, they did order heavy to get those 125s because that cover art was kind of so popular once it got, um, kind of showed through solicitation, but I don't think yet the secondary market has really jumped on board with that cover A, cover B yet. Um, and I expect at some point for us to see those rise. Plus, like you mentioned, Dan Piercy from the hot and cold show, he always talks about selling in sets. This silver surfer black set by Donny Cates is going to be in demand. People are going to want this. And just like with Thanos and just like they did um, uh, with his current runs with Venom and Guardians, people are going to want these back issues. This book is already going to a second print. They've already announced that. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for those cover A's and cover B's. Don't just chase that incentive. It's time to grab those up and, uh, you know, put those in that hold box. Right. And that is our recap from last week's Bolo List. Now, real quick, before we get into this week, I do want to say, please click that thumbs up button for us to let us know you like this video. And if this is your first time here, consider subscribing to this channel because we do a lot of comic and pop culture related content. In addition to this show, we have a lot of market watch. We have a lot of interviews, weekly picks, product reviews, all types of different content. So please click that subscribe button if you haven't already done so as well. So bolo list for this week, right, Jack? Yes, very excited. In my opinion, another very good week for comic releases. Right. It seemed there's a there's almost a trend when I first look at it to do weekly picks. You look at it before any news comes out of any of the books and you're like, man, this isn't a really heavy week. And then once you start going through it and then by like Sunday, Monday night almost into Tuesday, you're like, oh, holy cow. There's some like freaking books coming out that could be some heavy hitters. But right, I give you right here in the bullet list, right? Absolutely, and I give you a lot of credit for doing those Simple Men's Comics weekly picks because you've got to get out ahead of the week really early. And like, you're, like you just mentioned, you know, it's tough. You, you start looking at a list. Some of these books you never would have thought would have been as popular as they are, but for various reasons they really started to grow. Uh, kind of looked like a, a reader buzz week, but we've seen some of these books take off with, on the secondary market already. So, you know, it ends up being a really nice week, which is why you almost can't sleep on any new comic book day. Right. So, and you got to weigh that risk and then whether to let FOMO sit in or not, but. <laughs> right. But it also, again, if this is your first time watching the show, a little bit about the CBSI Bolo list. CBSI Bolo, Bolo standing for, be on the lookout for. Jack creates this list, usually Tuesday nights, sometimes early Wednesday morning. Goes on Instagram, all over different socials between Simple Man's Comics, ComicBookInvest.com, and AKA Mr. Bolo. And in that list, we capture first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz, and then Jack also offers a long-term play, one title each week that he thinks is worth buying and stashing away for future investment. Well, I don't want to say investment, but future value. Absolutely. But So with that being said, we're going to go right into first appearances for this week, right? So we had multiple different first appearances, some great books. Um, one's just a costume change, but that seems to be all we need right now with the secondary market. But we'll get to that in a second, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm excited to talk about that one, but we don't want to skip any of these because, honestly, every one of these first appearances has their own uh, reason why you should be speculating on them. Right. So, 
we're going to go right into the first one, which is a third print, but it still has the first appearances, right? Right. So, yeah, um, uh, there are people out there um, who don't consider late printing's first appearances. And while they may feel that way, the market has kind of shown otherwise. So, of course, right now we're talking about War of Realms, New Agents of Atlas, number one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as you mentioned, this is the third printing. Um, and what most likely, this is the most under-the-radar printing. People were kind of ready for that second print because the first print sold out, caught everyone off guard. And you got to remember, the first print, they double-shipped stores for free. And it still sold out, disappeared, and became a $10 to $15 spec book for the cover A. And then, of course, the incentive went crazy. We're already seeing solo series pop up from all of these characters from Agents of Atlas. Also, you got to understand, we just had the Hall H SDCC Marvel MCU announcements. And, of course, and we're going to talk about this more, but Shang-Chi was a big part of that. And Shang-Chi doesn't have the biggest universe. And a lot of these Asian characters from the Agents of Atlas... I think will really play into that universe well. So I'm very bullish on these Agents of Atlas characters and their possible short-term and long-term spec potential. This third print is going to be, my estimation, the lowest printing run of any of the first, second, or third printings. Um, maybe not the best cover we've seen, but nonetheless, you know, we know how how dominant that low print can be. How, how a market that that tends to get people's attention. So. This isn't a book I would expect you to be able to grab and get a real quick short-term game. We're recording this on Wednesday night, so it's tough. You know, the books just came out today. It's a little early to see what the pulse of the market is on most of these books. But at the same point, this is a book that I expect as time goes on, all we would need is some of these characters showing up in the MCU. And this book, people will realize the rarity in it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see just a few thousand print run on this book. Right. Yeah, you never know. Like, wishful thinking or long shot, but who knows? Could be the Booger Green, the Booger Green and Incredible Hulk, for all we know. Yeah. But, but. It's, it's one of those books where I, myself, I, again, I like, I like to be very transparent on this show and talk about what, where I'm putting my money. This is a book that I grab a few copies and I'm just going to put in the stash box and put away right. and see what happens. Right. Um, the smaller, I would say, I have to say smaller because... Third Eye Comics is my LCS, but not. I don't live in the Annapolis where the big store is, so I have the smaller one down by me. And they actually didn't have any copies of this there today. They had some in Annapolis. They called, and I got one coming down, but the smaller store near me didn't have any of this. And a couple other of the books as well. But and, and see, and I'm down in the Carolinas, and a lot of the stores down here don't even carry late printings quite often. Um, so, you know, I, this wasn't an easy find for me as well. I had to go the online route. Right. I will say one thing that's good is a lot of people overlook their later printings because Third Eye will have all the new releases in one area straight towards the back. And then down the, the side is all the back issues for the past whatever how many issues and those later printings they don't put them up there with the new releases so oh wow if the, if the new releases come new like newer printing comes out they automatically put them with the older releases so people don't go looking for them so i, I picked some up that way but yeah they now, didn't so have any of these there today check out the value that brian just gave you guys simpleman's comics family because i know some of you shop at third eye at the various stores i mean that's a major bolo he just gave you um, you know, giving away some of his own playbook there. Right. You can go hit those back issue bins and pick up those late printings. And that's what we try to do on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel and on the CBSI Bolo show is give you guys not just what books to look for, but a little bit of strategy to find them as well. Right. And I'll just take the time now to say shout out to Steve who owns Third Eye Comics. Lexi and Trish up there in Annapolis who usually take care of me from down here. And then down at my local comic book store, we got Sean and Ashley. Great people. Love Third Eye Comics. That's why I keep shopping from them. But... Moving on into the next first appearance this week, we actually have another printing, right? Right, right. Got a second printing this time. And this is Marvel Comics Presents number six. This like took off like gangbusters when it was the first print came out. It's still kind of heated up, huh? Especially with, with the covers. Oh, yeah. So, obviously, this was the first appearance of Rain, who is Wolverine's daughter, who now we've gotten more context on since the first appearance. When we were all kind of scrambling, like, who is this? What is this? Now we know 
that this entire series is told through her perspective, which kind of gives a little more value to you and I made the joke about Antonio Cromartie. If you guys don't know who Antonio Cromartie is, it's worth a Google. Uh, he's a man who has fathered many children, uh, just like uh, Wolverine. And um, so bonus points if you can say what college he played football at. Oh, yeah, and you should know that if you watch the Civilman's Commerce YouTube channel. <laughs> but, um, and I'll give you a hint, it's not Clemson. So, <laughs> so yeah, so this is, um, this was an issue where both Brian and I were kind of skeptical at the value of uh, Marvel Comics Presents Number 6 when the first print dropped and why people would almost really just FOMO out for that incentive. But I think at this point, there's a little more credence to this speculation knowing that, you know, this entire series was essentially written to surround her and to bring her into the focus. Um, so I don't have any idea where they're going to go with this character, but it seems as though Marvel does have a plan for her. Um, people are kind of ignoring the second print regular cover. And we've talked about this on this show. This is what tends to happen when these incentives get created for the second print. People order a lot because they know this is already a popular book. This is already a hot book. So they're ordering heavily to get that incentive, especially because you can see rain front and center on that incentive cover. So because of that, um, I think that cover A could be a stealth buy, could be the type of book you pick up cheap. Having said that, I don't think the print run will actually be lower by too much than the first print because the first print was under ordered. The second print people saw coming. So it'll be really interesting to see when these numbers get reported and what Comic Run end up, ends up saying about the print run of the second print versus the first print. Um, it's, it's anyone's guess, but I would actually expect them to be similar. And it's an, it wouldn't be impossible to see the second print actually larger printed than the first print. Um, but another book to keep an eye out for is issue number five, because she actually cameo appeared in issue number five, which is another incredibly low printed book. And it has a one in 50 Rob Liefeld incentive uh, to it. Um, but... This book, no signs of slowing down, incredibly popular, would not be shocked to see a third printing announced for this book. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I saw people, there was people calling the store today when I was there asking for copies of this. But so it was definitely being sought after. And like we said, it's hard to tell we're recording this Wednesday night. It's actually new comic book day today. So right. we're just going off of what we've seen and what we've observed with on release day. And, and there's some things that are just going nuts already. Yeah, the, I mean, the incentive's already double ratio and more. So, you know, it's already got that kind of heat behind it. All right. And then the next one on the first appearance list this week was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 41, right? Right. So we have a boom-confirmed um, first appearance of the Blue Omega Ranger. We saw the Omega Rangers debut kind of cameo style in issue number 40. Um, you know, I'm... I, it's, I want to talk about, we got a lot of comments when we talked about uh, Go Go Power Rangers number 21. And we talked about there being a first appearance of the Purple Ranger. And then we got a bunch of comments saying, well, Key Collector corrected that. Um, shout out to Key Collector and Nick, uh, good dude. Uh, but uh, it's important to note that we actually got the information about the, blue, the uh, uh, possible first appearance of the Purple Ranger from Key Collector originally. <laughs> That was actually originally the source that led to it getting included on the Bolo list. So um, they didn't really cor correct us. They kind of corrected themselves. But um, here, this was also reported by Key Collector to be official for Boom. Uh, we were able to get confirmation of that as well. And, you know, the thing, though, that I really want to drive home, which I tried to drive home with Google Power Rangers, is that's not really where the value in this series is, these first appearances, to be honest with you. I know the speculation community has jumps on first appearances as soon as they see them. But if you go back and you watch our two interviews with Arun Singh, who's the VP of Marketing for Boom Studios, um, Brian, myself, and uh, Andy Tomlin of the Indie Spotlight series, we spent a lot of time talking with him about this storyline, Necessary Evil. And, uh, you know, Brian had a line in the Wednesday Warrior article um, on comicbookinvest.com talking about the FOC variants, which is the variant that you see second from your right. Um, and he said that's like Pokemon. He's got He's got to collect them all. And I think that's the value in the in these this run. Um, myself, I love the FOCs. Brian and I have a little spoiler. We know where it's heading. So so we're strongly telling you to get on board with those now. 
but and you because I know that you may be you know a lot of people tend to shy away from those interior page covers, but it's going to lead somewhere that Power Ranger fans are going to be excited. But what I'm really bullish on actually is those foil covers. They are just outstanding. When you get that thing in person, it the cardstock cover, the foil, the amazing uh, kind of Goni Montez, you know, just the look with the helmet. It's really stunning, and they're doing this from issues 40 through 49. I think that's going to be, again, to quote Dan Piercy and the success of selling sets, I think that's going to be a set that's going to do extremely well. Um, so I want to make it really clear that where we have advocated Necessary Evil hasn't been from a first appearance perspective. The first appearances are kind of just icing on the cake. It's nice. Um, the value is the fact that that the common speculation community tends to ignore properties like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And every now and again, something happens that gets their attention, and this storyline is going to do it. And it's it's a slow-playing storyline, but it's going to get there. And at that point, once people jump on board, there isn't enough copies to go around. If you need evidence of that, look at how much we've advocated for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and look what's happening in the market right now with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Exactly what you see happening with Ninja Turtles is what we have talked about with this series, um, what we have already previewed, the Snake Eyes storyline that's coming down the pike from IDW and the success that we expect that one to have um, with G.I. Joe, um, starting with issue 265. So that's been the whole thing. Um, I know I've been a big advocate of IDW, Boom, properties like that. We get these cartoon and TV show properties, play big fish in the small pond, and, you know, when these things pop off, you're golden. And even if they really, truly don't, there just isn't a ton of supply to go around to meet the demand of the diehard crowd. And you can kind of wait, wait till you are the only one kind of on the market with those books and kind of set prices. We see that a lot with a lot of these, especially variants. And the book all the way on the right is that 1 in 20 Chris Anka variant. And those are pretty cool. They're trading card variants. And the interesting note about those, you never see those when you look at those online. That's another book that is looks incredible in person in comparison to the pictures that you're seeing online. If you flip the book over to the back cover, it actually has like a trading card back for a back cover. So definitely one you may want to put in like a clear board, those brand new kind of clear boards that have come out. Um, because it's a really great looking book. Uh, Chris Anka you may be familiar with, done a lot of work for Marvel. So shout out to Boom. Shout out to a room. They're really killing it with this um, Necessary Evil storyline, and we are very bullish on this entire storyline. I think you're going to see every issue through this storyline end up right here on the Bolo list. Be on the lookout for Go Go Power Rangers 22 coming up next. Right, and also news just came out that the next Power Rangers movie, they're, re they're rebooting the cast. They right. pretty much told the cast, um, new cast, so who knows what direction they'll take it. I mean, you don't know if it's going to be Necessary Evil or... Whatever it could be. Shattered Grid. That would be my, that would be, if I could ever speak to whoever is in charge of making the Power Rangers movie, give us Shattered Grid, give us Lord Draken, give us an adult Power Rangers. Um, I think that it will connect with the audience of kids that grew up watching Power Rangers. And either, just no matter what you do, give us Lord Draken. That's, that's what we need. And that's, again, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number nine, the first appearance of Lord Draken. I cannot advocate that back issue enough. Right. So moving on through the first appearances for this week is this is one that's actually heating up right now. I mean, it's what, $25, $30 on eBay, and this is the night of release, and this is Magnificent Miss Marvel number five. And what's the importance of this issue, Jack? We have a costume change, a new costume for Miss Marvel. Now, if, if you've watched the Bolo show, you know I don't like these first appearances. I don't like calling these first appearances um, things like costume changes and things like that. Um, you know, to me, don't always resonate with the market. And if I if I listed every one, we'd do them all the time. This was one I felt like we needed to list because of a couple of reasons. Number one, the homage to Secret Wars number eight, um, where obviously you get that black suit Spider-Man, I think kind of indicates the importance of this costume change. Secondly, you guys were talking about it. And before the show started and we really got kicked off, Brian explained to you guys that, again, the polo, this is your list. It's what you guys are talking about. So everyone was talking about this book, so I included it. Having said that, I never expected to see the prices hit what they're hitting. Like Brian said, twenty to thirty dollars already on this book. I, I think that it, there's a short supply of these books compared to what the demand is. Um, 
again, we live in the age of modern madness. Everything that comes out that's new, everyone's anticipating something big happening. Um, will this costume stick? That's what's going to be key. If this costume doesn't stick, this could be people throwing money away. Having said that, if this is the costume we see end up, say, when we see Camilla Khan in the movies, this could be a huge book. It all kinds of depends. It all kind of depends. That's what that's what I was thinking is it, when when she does make it into the MCU, whatever, what if she's wearing this costume? And then I think there's a degree of FOMO because, I mean, that Daredevil issue back in the day when he goes from the yellow to the red costume, that's, that, that did stick for a little bit, I guess. Right. Uh, this could be, you know, what if this could be that issue for, for Miss Marvel? But who knows? Probably go through about 12 different reboots before then. But, um, well, it's, it's, Camilla Khan and Miss Marvel always gets compared to Captain Marvel. Yeah. You have to think how many costumes did Captain Marvel had? Yeah. It, 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 none of those old costumes really are worth a ton. They may get their moment in the sun if she puts them on in the movie for a moment. But that's costume first appearances are dangerous. So if you're buying this for a speculation purpose, my, my only bet would be, you know, you're, you're hoping for that movie appearance. I think that's really the only way that you make some good money. Great looking cover. I have to say, I, both Brian and I are big fans of, uh, of homages and this is a great homage. Yeah. But yeah, I would not be spending $25 on it though. Just, that's just, that's just me, but right, man, me too. I mean, we advocate that on the, on the show every week. Don't chase the market. You know, if you were able to grab this book for cover price, go ahead and make that sale. Or if you feel strongly long term, hold on to it. But yeah. don't chase the price up the ladder. Um, you got to ask yourself, even if she showed up in a movie, what would this really be worth? Right. Um, and if you're paying 25 to $30, dollars, you just don't have a lot of meat on the bones left. Yeah. And if you're one of the people that's selling for 25 and $30 dollars and people are buying it, good job. Kudos to you because that's that's what the game is so that's what being a wednesday warrior is all about yeah. anticipating everyone else's fomo and taking advantage of it and not in a negative way i don't say taking advantage of it in a negative way that's just what the market is is where people who miss out they run on ebay and they want that copy and they're willing to pay whatever it's going to take and uh, those wednesday warriors who are out there hitting the lcs is calling their um local local comic crack dealer and you know, reserving those copies in their pull boxes. Shout out to you because you guys are winning today. Right. So, and then the last one for the first appearances of this week, we have Batgirl number 37, which we have a brand new Oracle, correct? Correct. And this was one I I'm excited about. Um, when the whole year of the villain thing got announced, there were a couple things that didn't seem to add up. And one of them was this Oracle cover. First off, you see this kind of green character. Great looking cover. Um, I think that's Joshua Middleton, if I'm not mistaken. Um, great looking cover. And immediately, it was like, well, who is this character? And then when you look at the solicit, it said Oracle variant. And immediately, you're like, well, that's not the Oracle I know. And how is Barbara Gordon, Batgirl, and Oracle at the same time? And now we have our answer that there's a new Oracle. And I haven't read this issue yet. Like, like Brian said, this is new comic book day today. I haven't read anything today. I've been working all day today but this is one i'm excited to read and check out um this is one that's going to fly completely under the radar because of some of the other releases like we said it's a, it's a good new comic book day there's a lot of reader buzz on, on a few of these releases um there's a few first appearances a few later prints and some hot variants and what that is going to equal is some of these books going completely under the radar I think Batgirl 37 is that case. It'll be interesting to see where this plays into Event Leviathan, which is a storyline that Brian and I are very bullish on, um, and how this will all play out. But I'm excited for this one. I pre-ordered a couple copies of the cardstock variant. I think that's the one to go to because, again, you got a first appearance. You get the cover appearance of a first appearing character. So that's that's all, always a nice little bonus. And then on top of it, you get the beautiful portrait with the – good heavy card stock variant so that that it would be my pick of the two covers if you were looking to speculate on this one but it's hard for me to tell you whether or not to advocate a real speculation play on this book because i haven't checked it out yet right the only thing that i might say about this is a lot of lcs has started stocking up on batman's title because of the josh middleton variants because a lot of those Middle middleton variants were getting high demand so one thing for like mine uh third eye comics 
This is one thing that they actually did have quite a few copies of just because of that popularity of Middleton. So I think there might be more copies there out there for that. But like you said, it still could dry up with the popularity if, if Oracle takes off and people start picking up and how it plays in Levi Event Leviathan, like you said. Right. Definitely more of a longer term play with this one than any sort of quick flip. Um, but either way, Batgirl isn't heavily ordered as a book in general. Right. But but I think what it could mean is that the cover A could be much lower printed than cover B, possibly, um, based on what you're seeing and what you saw. Let us know in the chat, guys, what you saw at your LCS yesterday. Did you what, – what was the ratio you guys were seeing cover A to B and how many of these seem to be available? I'd love to know that. Yep. I think for, for all these books, even. Yeah. So Definitely. That wraps up our first appearance section for tonight. So we're going to roll right into the Reader Buzz section. And there were some good books in the Reader Buzz section as well. Um, some of these books I was able to find. Some of them I wasn't able to find. Especially a certain 1 in 10 variant that we're going to talk about here in just a second. But um, in fact, we'll just bring it up right now, right? And this right. Is, uh, Star Pig number 1. This book, just the solicit alone... And the track record that IDW's had over the past few months, um, more so with their licensed content, but then their creator-owned, we saw Canto, um, Star Pig's another one. I, I said it reminds me kind of like a female teenage Peter Quill, just because of the soundtrack, 90s. That's it. That exactly is what it sounded like to me. And, you know, we got a, a space water bear, but... Um, they didn't have any at the store. They did reserve me one of the regular copies at Annapolis, and... They were all out of the one in ten incentives. So. And see, and that's been the key with these, um, with these uh, IDW creator-owned properties. And you're exactly right. IDW has been long known for GI Joe, Transformers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but they've got so many hits consecutively now from the uh, from these creator-owned. I mean, you're talking not just Canto, but like you said, Road of Bones, uh, Ghost Tree. Um, these are books that are selling out and going to late printings. I think Star Pig is on the way. There's so much reader buzz for this book. It's incredible. But I don't think people got on top of this book pre-FOC. This is also not a book where I see a lot of LCSs looking and predicting the market to go there. That's one thing, guys. You guys in the YouTube comic community, you guys in the Simpleman's Comics family, this is the advantage you tend to have over LCS owners. And it's not an LCS owner's fault. There's so much work that goes into running an LCS um, you know, you can't spend time consuming every piece of content that comes out. So a lot of LCS owners, they're making decisions based on prior track record. And if you're not really paying attention to what the market is doing, and I'm talking about the secondary market, remember guys, your LCS is the first market. They're not the secondary market. And if you're not paying attention to what's going on in the secondary market, you may have missed this trend of IDW creator owned books really on the rise. Because these print runs aren't really rising. So they're still low printed. They're still tough to get. And I think that that 1 in 10 incentive is going to really boom over the next week or so. Because I, I think the experience you had of not being able to find it, I think a lot of people are going to have. Right. Now I want to say the 1 in 10 actually looks a little different than what's on the screen. Right? I think I saw somewhere the IDW logo is down towards the bottom, if I'm not mistaken. Um, kind of almost looked more semi-virgin okay. variant-ish, but... I may be yeah. completely wrong, but I could have no, saw something like that. I just looked on eBay, and that's that's what it's looking like. It almost looks like a Virgin cover. Very different look from IDW. Kind of cool. And we're already seeing prices at twenty five dollars on the on the variant. Right. So you're talking and, two and a half times uh, ratio. Yeah, and if you had a chance to read it, let us know. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, like I said, I'll pick my copy up probably Sunday when I get back in town. But um, yeah, really looking forward to reading this issue. I'd also say be on the lookout for that San Diego Comic Con variant. There's a San Diego Comic Con variant that has kind of like a half black and white cover of the incentive. It's going for the same price as the incentive. So if you're buying this book for a long term spec play, maybe grab that uh, Comic Con variant too, because the price is kind of right for that. If you look at the prices of what a lot of these Comic Con variants are going for, it's insane. Even another IDW release, Canto, you got one listed on eBay for $200. So I'm not saying that that's what Star Pig is, but we're just getting into the game with Star Pig. Right. <clears throat> so before we get into the next one, I just want to remind everyone this is a live premiere tonight. We aren't live as we normally are, but I do know without a fact that the chat's going off right now. I bet you 
Elephant in the Room's in there saying some funny stuff that normally has me laughing. I know Cantankerous is in there. I'm sure Comp Man Andy. I mean, I could just imagine all the regulars. Hopefully, we got new, some new people coming into the chat as well. Jack, you'll have to let me know how that goes. But again, Definitely. this is a premiere tonight, and we will be back live next week. So moving right on into the next on the Reader Buzz, we actually have um, Swordmaster, right, number one. Right, right. Swordmaster number one. Um, I mentioned earlier about Shang-Chi. This is the book to me that really plays into that. Um, we just got the announcement. It was already rumored. It was already talked about, but now it's official. Shang-Chi is coming to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And with this character, you know, we talk a lot on this channel about world building. And the reality is there isn't this huge world built around Shang-Chi because here's a character that was pretty prevalent in the 70s and then kind of went away for a long period of time. The, the most recent Shang-Chi comic was a one-shot done through the Marvel Legacy uh, run that was actually written by former professional wrestler, a.k.a. the best in the world, CM Punk. That's a, a book that I don't think a lot of people realize Maybe you should be on the lookout for that one and its variants because I, I think that was probably a low printed book and one a lot of people slept on. I haven't heard anyone talking about that book. But Swordmaster having just been created as part of the new Agents of Atlas um, and really tying into Shang-Chi, I think there's even a cover with Shang-Chi on the cover. I really think that this is going to be a book to keep an eye out for. Um, I, I think obviously if you're looking speculation, the first appearance is probably – the larger spec play, but I don't think these are going to be heavily ordered. I don't think they're going to be readily available come to a year or two from now when that Shang-Chi movie hits. And I have no doubt we're going to see a large Asian cast in that movie. Um, that, that movie will be predominantly Asian, Asian American or native Asian characters. I really think that Swordmaster could very well be in play quicker than most Marvel characters that are created. And I even go so far as to thinking that New Agents of Atlas was created as a property because they knew they wanted to really tap into this Asian market with the cinematic universe. So we talk on this channel a lot about diversity and the value of diversity and not forced diversity, but just really natural diversity. And I think that's what this is, is, you know, they're trying to reach that Chinese movie market and they, they have a character in Shang-Chi that they want to release. And MCU has done really well with... Um, hitting these different genres. We've got horror coming up. They've already really killed the comedy uh, genre, done extremely well there. And now it seems like we're going to get a little kung fu, a little action movie flick kind of thing. And um, I think Swordmaster would fit in perfectly with that. So this is a completely under-the-radar book from the spec community, but maybe one that people should keep an eye for. And also interesting note is that action figure variant. Now, while people have seen these action figure variants and they, they've been on the market for a long time, and to be honest with you, speculators pretty much ignore them. They end up in dollar boxes. That book sold out at Midtown. Could be just indicative of Midtown and how they ordered, but just an important piece of information to know. Right, and it's weird. Um, I mean, I understand it's you've seen them, but usually a number one title from Marvel, I expected about... Uh, 6,000 more covers for it, but we just got the two, so that's a good thing. Yeah. And then the next book we wanted to talk about on the Reader Buzz, this was another one that had a lot of Reader Buzz behind it, of course, which was Guardians of the Galaxy number seven. This starts the story arc for um, Death of Rocket Raccoon, correct? Correct. Now, I am seeing that there is a 1 in 25 variant for Swordmaster. Gotcha. People are selling on eBay. So that is important to know before you guys go in the chat and start trying to correct us a whole yeah, bunch. But That's my mistake. My, my bad. But to be honest, I don't care about that book that much. <laughs> yeah. I, don't think, I don't think it was heavily ordered. I don't think you're going to see a ton of them. Uh, it does look like it's a um, Philip Tan cover. Right. But, yeah, so that's something to keep an eye out. Now, let's move into a book that there's a ton of buzz and I think a lot of people care about, and that is Guardians of the Galaxy number 7. As soon as that original cover art that you see on your left side, that cover A cover art with the bloody rocket hand got released, the speculation community went rampant. Now, if you're an OG speculator, if you've been in this game for a long time, Brian, who among us hasn't been burnt by a death issue? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Do you have one in mind that you've been burnt by, Brian? Yeah, uh, Captain America. Captain America? I, I, you know what mine is? Batman 40 from the new 52. Yeah. Trey, I'm looking at you, buddy. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, you know, no. Um, that was a book that uh, we were able to get some early information in the early days of CBSI. The old owner, Trey Kenyon, he uh, put out that information. And a lot of us jumped on board and a lot of us made some money. But we also learned a lesson about death issues, which is the window for them is so small. So if you order heavy, you get stuck with copies. I still have a short box full of Batman 40. I kid you not. Um, and the variants. But um, this book, we did not, I'll tell you, we know our community is, they want spoilers. They want us to talk about the books. This was a book I read. Rocket did not die. But this arc is called The Death of Rocket Raccoon. And it's important to note, he is not in good shape at the end of this book. No, but that's he's, such an awesome panel. I mean, I don't even say panel. I mean, page. page. That splash page. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, and tell me that that page doesn't really bring out the character that we see play out in the movies. Like, I could totally see Bradley Cooper, you know, talking in that panel and um, the condition of Rocket. Yeah, uh, it, it's where he could actually use those parts he was asking for in the movies. <laughs> the legs and the eyes. Right. <laughs> So this is a this is a book where it's sold out at Diamond, um, it's selling out at retail. It you people may not have gotten the death they expected and wanted. I'm telling you, grab this arc. I really think that this arc. I've been saying that this entire Guardians of the Galaxy run is being slept on, and it's because so much attention is being paid to Kate's other work. And I really think that this Guardians of the Galaxy run could end up being something you see in your movie screen one day um there's no reason to think that once they decide not to not to continue with some of the characters in guardians of the galaxy that they won't um keep this movie going and that's kind of the beauty of team books which you guys know i'm not a huge fan of um but i i really like this series, I've enjoyed Donny Cates' run on Guardians of the Galaxy. I haven't been traditionally a huge Guardians of the Galaxy reader. I've enjoyed the movies, um, but I haven't been a huge reader. I'm liking this series, uh, and I'm interested to see where this arc goes. And I really think that this could honestly be a $10 book regardless of Rocket's death or not. Um, I think the cover art, the cover image there is iconic. I think that is an incredible... You want to you want to put out cover art that draws people in, that says what it needs to say without saying it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Carnageized variant. Having said that, um, I I think the cover art alone was maybe the reason why that book wasn't ordered heavy, and I still think it's going to have some spec value because I don't think it's going to be readily available everywhere as this this time runs on. But this is the true antithesis of a reader buzz book. This book was buzzing for because readers wanted to know what's going to happen to Rocket. And like a lot of reader buzz books, it takes a couple issues sometimes for people to realize, oh, wow, I can't get that issue anymore. Maybe issue number eight comes out and they really want to read it. And they're like, oh, I want to get seven, but set, they can't find seven. And that's when books start to really pop on the secondary market. So I'm not saying this is going to be a huge spec play, but it's sold out of diamonds, It's not available. I wouldn't be surprised to see a second print coming soon. And um, I think that this is a run you're going to want to grab. Right. Yeah, to me, it looked like a, a carnageized Sonic. <laughs> I, I agree. But, and I looked at it, and I'm not kidding. I, I had the carnageized variant in my hand, and then I kept looking at the regular cover A. And I looked at it. About, it took me like a good 45 seconds, and I put the carnageized back and grabbed the, the cover A just because I liked it that much better. But So... And then the last book on Reader Buzz section tonight is the Valkyrie number one, right? Right. What is hotter than Jane Foster right now? So this is a book that um, Brian and I caught some heat for because we did not really, we were really high on War of Realms Omega and the first appearance of uh, Jane Foster as Valkyrie. As to we be honest, I, I'm still not. I mean, and I and I feel validated by the news that we got that Jane Foster is now going to be Thor in the MCU. Um, do I think that in the long run this may pay off? Yes, because maybe she goes from being Thor to being Valkyrie. That's possible. But um, 
you know, I want to say shout out to uh, Larry Doherty, a longtime retailer from up in the Massachusetts area, who's an active member of our Facebook group. Uh, very polarizing figure. People either love him or hate him. But he's a very veteran speculator, and he tends to have his kind of ear to the grindstone, know what's going on, uh, it, you know, with the speculation community. And he was very bullish on this pre SDCC announcement. Um, now, I, I don't know how he would feel about this right now. Yeah, given the information that we got. Nonetheless, it's interesting to see that because of just Jane Foster being in the conversation, people are all over this book. Um, now, the ratio variants aren't necessarily selling above ratio, but they're creeping. The real winner seems to be that cover B, that um, Hentrich variant. Um, I think it's just kind of beautiful cover art. It was a book I picked on the Wednesday Warrior article. Um I just really kind of uh, caught a lot of people by surprise. I think it has potential to be a $10 book. Tell the viewers which one that is in the picture. That is top row, middle, the second book uh, in the top row. Um, and, you know, where you get kind of like that really colorful background going on. Um, so th this is one to keep an eye That's one to keep an eye on. It may have gotten overlooked from people as they were trying to get to their incentives. Um the hidden gem incentive, I think, is pretty cool. The one that you see the largest image of on the screen. Um, I think that that's kind of cool. It kind of shows some, you know, Jane Foster kind of through through different, you know, lenses there. But um, my favorite cover I, for this was um, the Terry Dotson. And it's not because it has anything to do with Jane Foster or Valkyrie. It's just that cover. With the wings reminds me of the Terry Dots and Masters of the Universe uh, Shira variant. That's so high. I, I could see that. I could see that. I could see that for sure. And we know if you know anything about Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel, you know that Brian Wood is a major Masters of the Universe mark. He loves that stuff. So definitely. Yeah, me and uh, definitely Sean Leggett. We geek out on Masters of the Universe stuff. <laughs> so, but yeah. It, kudos, Sean turned me on to Master Universe books that I wasn't even aware of at one time, and and yeah. And then I also got a cool book to, in the mail today. It's called What Would Skeletor Do? It's basically a bunch of stupid things of you know how to deal with coworkers and all this, and it's all from like a Skeletor point of view. It's like basically be nice, and then once you once you get through your work project, and then just find ways to to destroy everyone. But it's a good uh, light reading book. Yeah, I saw I saw your uh, social media post on that. It definitely looks interesting. Uh, <laughs> life advice from Skeletor. Yeah. But anyways, sorry, I freaking distracted us. Back to Valkyrie. <laughs> yeah, because we may be we may be pre-recording this, but we are one taking this thing, man. Yes. We're going through this thing as if it's a live show. But yeah, I mean that's about it on Valkyrie. I mean Jane Foster is hot right now. We talk on the channel about SEO, um, search engine optimization. There's a lot of people searching for Jane Foster on eBay, and I think some of these prices may be indicative of that. Um, just there's a lot of people typing in Jane Foster in that search box, and it's the perfect time because they're going to get this. Um, another interesting thing, <coughs> excuse me, as I brought up Larry Doherty, is the comparison that he made was to Immortal Hulk. Now, don't kill me. That's his, his words, not mine. But this is obviously an Al Ewing and um, and Jason Aaron kind of co-written story. Al Ewing is the writer behind Immortal Hulk, and he thinks that this will garner that type of reader buzz. So if you read this book in the chat, let us know what you thought. Um, are we on our way to that type of buzz? I'm skeptical, but like I said, uh, Larry's a vet in the game. I don't know if he's just trying to back up his own investment or if he is uh, – you know, really that all in on this book. So let us know what you guys thought. Right. And with that being said, that wraps up our reader buzz section for tonight. So once again, guys, do us a huge favor. Click that thumbs up button for us. And since we aren't able, well, Jack's in the chat, but also make sure you comment. If you're watching this on replay, give us a comment. Let me know what books you guys like this week. Let me know what books that he didn't have on the below list that you guys were interested in. I mean, that's I'm something that comes up also. Yeah, and I'm going to point one thing out. I will go ahead and admit this. This was an oversight on my part. House of X should be in the reader bus section. I got a couple comments on that, and people trying to tell me, oh, you know, like, come at me. 
which is fine. You know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. I say we own Wednesdays. I'm going to get some shots every Wednesday. I know that. But that book should have been in the reader buzz section. That was an omission on my part. We will talk about that book in the variant section. But no doubt that's a solid reader buzz book. So for all of you out there who are wondering why that book wasn't included, just an omission. It's my fault. Right. And speaking of variant buzz, we're going to go right into the variant buzz section now. So some great books here as well. Um, and it's weird, like we talked about at the beginning, I could have sworn when we started this week off it was going to be a light week. Now it wasn't like a heavy hitter Grand Slam week, but there were some great books that came out, right? There's some props to be made in this variant section, for sure. Um, and yeah, there, there were some we saw coming, but it's more about the ones we didn't see coming. Right. And I haven't been paying too much attention today, I know... Um, but this was definitely like my pick of the week, and this was the Jenny Frizen 1 in 25 Age of Conan Beelit variant. Right. So if you go again, plug the Wednesday Warrior column on comicbookinvest.com. Brian picked this as his top incentive pick, and I couldn't let him get away with that, and I picked it as my top spec pick. Because, number one, we both love Jenny Frizen. Uh, we both are true believers in her as an A-list talent. Um also, this is a title that hasn't been in exceptionally popular. And because of that, the print run hasn't been kind of what the other yeah. Conan series have been. Yeah, it's under – issue four was under – it was like 15,600 something. Estimated. Right. That's estimated, of yeah, course. Just, just below – yeah, just below 16,000. And it's important to know, whenever you read numbers on comic Ron, they don't get all of the information. They get the information from them, and there's always a larger print run than what they say. Yeah. Nonetheless, it, it's good for comparing book A to book B. This series is getting far, far lower distribution than the other Conan series is. So because of that, and then the fact that we're on issue five, and you keep seeing like books dwindle, and I'm going to put another plug out there for our interview with Arun, who really opened a lot of people's eyes. I don't think that video has gotten enough um, eyes on it. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that for you guys. Whether or not you like Boom Studios or not, a room has given you game on the industry in that video. And then both of those videos. And one thing he talked about is the drop off in, from issues. From issue one to issue two, you see a 50% decline. And he, that represents the speculation community. That represents you guys. Um, issue number two to issue number three, you'll see na- another 50% drop off. Um, and then after that, you're kind of fighting for your core base. And as it goes, there's almost always a dwindling from issue to issue. So by the time you get to issue five, you're seeing lower print runs. And as Brian mentioned, the estimated print run on issue four was about si- oh, just under 16,000. I would expect this one to be pretty similar. Guys, that means there's going to be less than 1,000 of these variants on the market. Factor in diamond damages and everything else. Um, this could end up being... I'll go so far as to say this has a shot at being a long-term big-dollar book. We're already seeing sales of $80. Um, it's in high demand. It's gone anywhere from $60 to $80. Um, I could see by the time this show airs my pricing of this being out, out of date. Um, I could easily see this being a $100 book. I think there's a lot of Jenny Frizen completionists out there. I think there's a lot of Conan completionists out there. And, uh, you know, I think this book is a gorgeous cover. On fire cover artist. Uh, the female driven covers always do really well, um, and I think all of those things kind of combined could end up making this the book to get this week. Right, and I've read, I've been reading Savage Sword of Conan. I've been reading Conan the Barbarian. I read the first issue of this, and then it kind of dropped off. But this, I had this on my weekly picks just because mostly, like you, all the reasons you said it was a number five issue. Issue number four didn't have that many sales figures. And then the fact that it's a Jenny Friesen who had three different covers out this week between this Fearless Connecting variant and then the Cheetah uh, You're the Villain variant. I mean, <laughs> kind of a hot artist right now. So it, it, Every one of those covers easily could have been on this list. Yeah. So, yeah. And then we're going to move on to what should have been in the reader buzz but is in the variant buzz. And there were so many covers on here, so I just kind of collaged it. So bear with me on here. But House of X, number one. Right. So this begins Jonathan Hickman's, I don't know what to call this, rebranding, re-kind of configuration of all things X, all things mutant, 
for Marvel Comics. Um, love them or hate them, Jonathan Hickman has done a good job managing these large scale projects. Um, not everybody loves his writing. Some people are huge fans of his. Um, it kind of depends, but he seems to be Marvel's go to when they want to do something large scale. And this is certainly large scale. I will say the immediate reader buzz, I've been paying attention to what people are saying out there in the market today, has been very good for this. I've seen a lot of people talk about this book who don't tend to like X-Men stories, who have really liked it. I'm an X-Men fan. Brian's not much of an X-Men fan. Um, and, you know, that's what you tend to see that in the market. And I think that's kind of sometimes the difference between Brian and I have a slight age difference, not a huge one, but a seven or eight year age difference. And I grew up with that like 90s um, X-Men cartoon and that really being my everything. And uh, that Jim Lee run means so much to me. And because of that, I'm always going to be an X-Men fan. But I'm the first one to admit X-Men comics have been a mess for years. Some of them have been good. Some of them have been bad. But there's just so many teams. There's so many people. It's spread out. It's hard to keep up with. If you're an X fan, how do you read it all? How do you figure it all out? You read one book, and you think you have an idea of continuity, and then you read another book, and it's like, wait a minute, these two don't jive. So I'm glad that they're redoing everything and kind of putting things back under one banner, under one focus. Um, I'm excited to see when they get through the House of X and Powers of X uh, storylines, which, by the way, are going to bring new characters into the fold. They've already released design uh, sketches for several new X-Men characters, so that's something to be on the lookout for. Um, I'm excited to see how much more focused and driven each individual title is going to be. We also know from, again, talking about Hall H, SDCC, Kevin Feige said the mutants are coming. So we know that this is going to happen. And again, where they draw inspiration from is anybody's guess. But um, I'm excited to see it. And I think most X fans are excited to see it. And I'm very happy that a lot of people who tend to be like Brian, who aren't X-Men fans, were also very excited to see, read this story and say, okay, I like where this is going. Right, so I did pick up, I actually picked up the Marco Cicchetto cover, just because I'm a big fan of Marco Cicchetto, but, and then I did, I haven't had a chance to read it, but I did th thumb through it while I was at the comic book store, and then even Ashley, who worked at the comic book store, she brought it up to me, and I've heard Dan Piercy talk about it tonight as well, is the John Hickman, um, I call it Codex, you know, the, right. the little symbols, the hieroglyphics, and um, evidently, don't skip over that, because Ashley Third Eye told me that there's actually some pertinent information in there that's worth reading. So, me, I, I'm, I'm that type of person where I'll get lazy like that, where I'll see stuff like that. I'm like, this has nothing to do with it. I'm staying with just the story. But So, if you read it, let me know what you guys thought about those as well, the little, I call them codex, but I don't know what to call them. So, Brian, you say the Chicharetto variant, that's your favorite variant that they released? Yes. Well, yeah, I like just... There's a couple of them that I liked. I liked, well, and I didn't want to spend a lot of money on the incentives, mm -hmm. but the Chichetto one was the first one I saw that was the regular price, and I, and I grabbed that one. But there was a couple other. The Noto one, I'm a fan of Phil Noto as well. My buddy picked that up today. Um, and then uh, I forget who does the, the orange one. I forget who did that, but that's a gorgeous cover. Yeah, see, for me, I like... I'm with you on Chicharetto. I, I probably butchered his name, but um, you know, I, I, <laughs> Chitty Chitty yeah, Bang Bang. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a I'm a fan of his. Um, another thing I will bring up is the party variants. Right. You had to have a midnight release to get those party variants. Um, not every store is going to jump on board. We've seen in the past those books tend to hold water on the market. Um, there is a regular and then a one per store that were involved in that those are ones to keep an eye on my favorite as far as cover art is the and this is another name i mess up but joe mad madrera yeah um where you get that the kiss between rogue and um gambit that really harkens back to again bring up the jim lee run a jim lee cover um i can't remember the issue number i want to say it's in the like the 20s um that's a book, if you look that book up, uh, somebody put it in the chat, um, if you can remember, which it, what's the issue number. 
That is a book I'm going to quote uh, my man Tim Walker. If you guys aren't familiar with Tim Walker, Tim Walker is a contributor for comicbookinvest.com. He writes the Walker Report, one of the most talented resellers in the game. Yeah, he's, um, like, he's like the Guardians of the Ga- He's like the Benicio Del Toro collector for, right. for CBSI. He is the guy that we all kind of look up to like, man, this guy, how does he do this? How does he find these books? Um, and the funny thing about him is he's the nicest guy. He'll actually tell you if yeah. you reach out to him and you talk to him, he'll give you um, kind of a look inside his kind of operation and how he does things. Um, he's giving me tips all day. Matter of fact, you know what, guys? Today, he hit me up with a nasty My Little Pony tip uh, just to let you guys know. So that's a guy who's like me. He doesn't care if it's making money. He's getting in on it. But he schooled me to that to that Rogue and Gambit cover years ago that it's just popular. And, you know, it's a book you can find in the dollar bins a lot of times, but sells regularly, 15 bucks, uh, 20 bucks at times. So that's one to keep an eye out for. So I like seeing that cover kind of getting homaged here. Um, and I think that it could be popular. It's currently selling for about half ratio. So like, like kind of like Brian said, this is a large print run. These ratios aren't really doing much on the market. But yeah, as far as one that I like the most, that's my pick. Right. And then next on the variant list, we had the, the long title, Web of Venom Funeral Pyre number one. Right. So you get kind of... um. The Return of Funeral Pyre, if you're not a big Venom fan, you may not realize this, but this was previously a miniseries that was released um, back in, what, the early 90s. So as part of this Venom, Web of Venom uh, run, kind of gearing up with all these symbiotes for absolute carnage, um, you see we have two variants there. On the left, we've got the Clayton Crane 125 variant. On the right, we've got the... Uh, it's called like the Codex variant or something like that. Yeah. Um, not, um, yeah. Coax. Coax. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Uh, to be There's a series of those variants going on. Um, it, but both of these covers have been heavily talked about in our Discord chat with the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Uh, our, our Patreon Discord chat. People have been really bullish on these covers. Clayton Crane is exceptionally popular. It, the Clayton Crane variant reminds me a little bit, though, of an ins- of a exclusive that he did for Frankie's Comics with um, Venom and Carnage. So I don't know if he kind of based it off that, but it might just be the purple background that's doing it. Um, I like that cover a lot. I like kind of like the She Venom uh, Mia. I don't know who that is, who that character is. I, I, Mania, I thought was a guy, but there seems to be symbiote breast there so i'm not really sure uh what the deal is but that i like that cover i think clayton crane's got a built-in fan base and obviously the other cover on the right you get that one in 50 so you get that larger incentive these books are being overlooked a little bit with some of the other stuff coming out but one thing really holds true is that symbiote incentives sell well whether it's release day whether it's a year down the line whether it's two years down the line in the time that I've been in the speculation game, it's amazing how many symbiote books come out. Don't pop off immediately, and then a year or two from now, you're looking on eBay like, wait, this goes for what? So, yeah, if you can grab this one for ratio or below, I think that you have a good hold possibility there. Right. <clears throat> so, Coax is the name of the artist that did the cover. Okay. I, and, and that artist is going to be doing several different Marvel right. incentives. Yeah, and he's done some before. Um, yeah, when I first looked at it, I didn't know how to say. It. I didn't know it was that artist. I've seen it before, as far as Coax variant, but. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, the last one for the variant buzz section. Since turtles are hot, you have Rise of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Sound Off Number One. This is the one in ten variant for this. Right now, I'm often an advocate of these mini series. You guys have heard me talk about this with My Little Pony. These where you have these, you know, very popular series like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then a mini-series comes out, which tends to be lower printed. Um, I also talked about this with G.I. Joe, Sierra Muerte. Having said that, this one caught me by surprise. This is just FOMO at its finest, if you're asking me. Because I don't know if you guys are Turtle fans. If you're a Turtle fan, let me know what you guys think about Rise of the Ninja Turtles. Um, I will tell you as soon as this series was talked about, I immediately was not interested. I actually went to a panel with 
Ben Bishop and Kevin Eastman, where this show was talked about. I got a chance um, through being a CBSI representative to kind of sit down and talk with Kevin Eastman a little bit. And um, I straight told him I wasn't excited about this TV show. He told me he had nothing to do with it, but to give it a chance. And I did. And I actually watched the entire first season with my with my kids and did not like it. Um, as a wrestling fan, I liked that John Cena was playing the bad guy. thought that was kind of cool. Um, but is it because if you're at all familiar with John Cena, he has never been the bad guy in pro wrestling. And most of us wrestling fans have been dying to see him play that role. Never did it. So it was kind of cool to see him do that, uh, you know, with Ninja Turtles. Having said that, they changed so much about the dynamic of the brothers. Um, the four Ninja Turtles, obviously, you know, Leonardo's the oldest. He's the leader. I come from a set of four brothers. I'm the oldest. I've always kind of like called myself the Leonardo of my family. Um, I have a brother who is just like Raphael. He's a knucklehead. Um, he, he wants to be the leader. I have another brother who's a goofball like Michelangelo. And I have another brother who's an IT guy. We call him the nerd of the family. He's definitely the Donatello. Um, so I, Are they all named Daryl? They, oh. they are not. <laughs> they are not. As Mark, Scott, and Steven. But those, those guys, um, we've always related to the Ninja Turtles for that reason. Um, we always called our father Master Splinter. Um, so that, I'm a big Turtle fan. And they changed that dynamic. They actually made, and you can see front and center is Raphael on this cover. They made Raphael the leader. Um, which I think just takes so much of the story out because so much of the tension with the brothers is between Raphael and Leonardo, where Raphael may be the most talented. He may be the best fighting Ninja Turtle, but he's not level-headed and he can be selfish. And it takes Leonardo to humble himself and say, you know what, I'm probably not the best. But at the same point, I know how to lead and put people in the positions they need to be. So that is the story I grew up in that was very prevalent in the original um ninja turtles movie um and going in even to the second ninja turtles movie um where you know you see those brothers kind of butt heads um you kind of eliminate that and i feel like in this show leonardo has no real place who is he if he's not the best fighter and he's not the leader what is his role so now that i went on my turtle tangent and again guys i told kevin eastman this to his face so if i'll tell kevin eastman i'll tell you guys um the original Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle series had no heat on it. If you go back and look at those incentives, those are readily available on the market. If you want those, go get those. They're cheap. Six bucks, eight bucks, ten bucks, below ratio. And they're also not very highly printed. Um, but this, a miniseries, you get even a smaller print run. But this book has disappeared. You cannot find this book on the, on the open market. I just did an eBay search and I didn't see any. Um, the last one that sold went for about 20 bucks. I expect that to be a lot higher. You guys know my strategy. If you've been watching this show is when you get an IDW incentive and nobody's got one on the market, name your price. If I was listening to this book right now, I'd put it at like 49 99 and I believe you could get a sale. And I really think this is just residual heat from what's going on with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They're red hot. Guys, understand this book has nothing to do with Jenica Turtle. You're not going to see her in this in this series. This is based on the Nickelodeon cartoon. This is definitely slanted towards a younger audience. It's very prevalent in the art style. But we see this on the market, man. When that when that heat gets on something, it gets on everything. And we kind of talked about that earlier with Jim Foster Valkyrie. And I think that's the case here. But either way... Um, it's going to be low printed. It's going to be hard to find. And if you want one in your collection, you you know you may struggle to be able to find one. Right. So who did the cover on that? I'm not even sure. I I was just curious. I mean, I didn't look. It kind of has a little bit of a Katie Cook look to it, but <laughs> yeah. But and that wraps up the variant buzz section. So again. If you guys tuned in late, you might have figured it out by now we aren't live tonight. This is a lot. This is actually a premiere, but rest assured we will be live next week at the 9 p.m. on Thursday night. Um, had to premiere tonight as I'm out of town on vacation for the weekend. So thanks for you guys tuning into the chat right now. Jack's in there with you guys, so you guys are in good hands. 
What was? You got a little stink face going on. You know, had to had to throw my spurs up. Let them know I'm in the chat with you. Gotcha. Or as my man Comic Man Andy would say, "Pinky's out." <laughs> yeah. So speaking of Comic Man Andy, if you guys watched the hot cold list last night, um, or if it's on replay right now, he ha we had a guest hot pick and cold pick from Comic Man Andy from Simple Man's Comics Patreon group. Fantastic job, loved it, and I loved his little ruski hat he had on for his cold pick, and he had great picks, right? Yeah, and guys, I'm sure he's in the chat right now, so show my man some love, because he was nervous about doing this, and he knocked it out of the yeah. park. Uh, he had no reason to be nervous. He's a natural. Uh, I hope we get to see him more on the channel, but guys, that's, that's another little bonus for our Simpleman's Comics family, our you know Patreon members, is we brought, we had Sarah show up and interrupt the last episode and drop some Ninja Turtles spec on the Hot and Cold show, and then now we brought in Andy, and that's something we hope to do in the future, guys. No matter how big this channel grows, we never want to be the type of people who are like, oh, I don't want to work with somebody because I'm, I'm this or I'm too big. We want to be inviting to everybody in the family. And we use the term family for a reason. So everybody watching this show, you guys are all Simpleman's Comics family, and we appreciate you. Yeah, yeah definitely value community over content. So Absolutely. That's why we appreciate everyone that's in the chat right now or that comments on, and is watching this video. But... Now we're going to get into your long-term play of the week, right, Jack? Right. And not hard to figure out. It's the one book we haven't talked about that really came out this week that was on people's radar. And that was Batman White, or was it Curse of the White? I'm messing yeah. up the title. Batman Curse yeah. of the White Knight. Right, Batman Curse of the White Knight. This is essentially volume two of Sean Murphy's White Knight saga. Um, I, I got to tell you. I slept on the original White Knight series. It took me three issues before I started chasing the other books. Um, you guys know me. I'm not big for paying up the ladder, so I didn't. Um, and I had to wait till the series kind of died down to go grab some stuff. Man, what a fun read it was. I'm a big fan of these kind of Elseworld stories. And I used to not be um, because it was kind of like a reader-only thing. And now I think those days are over. Um, my speculation on this is that DC can do anything with this series that they want to. They could do a movie based on based on this series, these series, these series of stories. It could definitely be an animated feature without a shadow of a doubt. And we are in the post Spider Verse world where just because something's an animated feature doesn't mean that it's any less of a speculation play. But the introduction of the Neo Joker, the introduction of the dynamic with uh, Harley Quinn, some of the talk that the three diamonds on Harley Quinn's logo could be in reference to the three Jokers, um, the sort of subtle differences that we see with Batman himself in this series have been extremely popular and well-received. And then, of course, as you can see on your screen, this second volume brings in Azrael, Az Azriel, however you want to pronounce that name. I've heard it pronounced all kinds of ways, but essentially, you know, a night version of Batman um, and kind of a vigilante style character um, who has been extremely popular since he was originally created in the 90s um, and has been popular through used in cartoons, um, was featured on the TV show Gotham. Uh, definitely a popular character, and now he's entering this White Knight uh, storyline. And the other thing that makes this, to me, even better speculation is the fact that they almost didn't know what to do with this series when they first created it. It was just sort of this thing Sean Murphy was doing. If you're not familiar with Sean Murphy, he's actually Scott Snyder's old, you know, tag team duo that they were partners. Like they uh, did the, the Wake. Wake. Oh, was it Wake? Yeah. Remember that series? Yeah, The Wake from, uh, that was what, Image, or Vertigo? Or Vertigo, I believe. Vertigo, yeah. So, you know, they came up together uh, through kind of the DC Comics process of, you know, where they bring in young talent and kind of cultivate them. And uh, it was interesting when he moved into Batman. He did some, some variants uh, during, like, the New 52 and into Rebirth. But it, at some point, they just decided, let, you know what, let's let him kind of have his own playground to play with. Take these iconic characters like Batman, Joker, Harley Quinn, and kind of 
tell his own story. And like I said, man, I was skeptical when this thing first started. I, I'm a Batman fan. I've got my Batman. I know Batman. It took me a while to get on board with Batman Beyond. It took me a while to get on board with Thomas Jane Flashpoint Batman. Um, but now I love them all. And I think that this is no different. And I can't, I can't say enough how much I think it's important that this book has now been put under the DC Black Label. Everything Black Label's been hot. Everything Black Label's done well. Um, and putting this under the Black Label really gives it a home, gives it a place where these stories now make sense. And rather than just being a comic that's out there from DC Comics that they don't know how to market. Um, like I said, that the White Knight series went under the radar. Each book went to like three, four printings. Some of those covers are amazing. Um, putting together a master set of that is difficult. Um, and I would expect to see similarity from this series. Now, this is a little bit under the radar today. Definitely a reader buzz book, but not a book that you're seeing those immediate speculation plays. Um, some of that's because it's a volume two. Some of that is because, you know, there's we, so many other books that we talked about are extremely popular and people are you know, chasing. But for me, my, my perception on this has changed. My perception on this Sean Murphy series has changed. So that's why I really wanted to talk about this book tonight and see if maybe some of you who were doubting may want to come around to my school of thought. And again, here's another thing that I'll bring up. The Joaquin Phoenix uh, Joker movie that's coming out. That is not based on any sort of comic. Um, I think we're all grasping for straws, trying to figure out what version of Joker that was going to be. And now we know from what the director has said is that they really didn't use comic source material. And look, we live in an era now where doing that and using comic source material seems to be the way Marvel goes to an extent. But even they branch off and depart from the comic storylines. Um, certainly, if you've read Infinity Gauntlet um, and Infinity War, that's not the story they told, it, you know, with, through Endgame and Infinity War and all that. It, w it, it was maybe loosely based on it, but they went and took their own direction. So there's no reason to believe that there, it, there can't be a DC Elseworlds movie telling this version of the Joker and Batman. And there's no reason it can't be popular because DC has struggled to, with this, their movie franchise to get any sort of consistency and continuity going. And I'm bullish on the idea of JJ Abrams taking the helm and kind of being a Kevin Feige for DC, but we don't officially know if that's really what his role is going to be with Warner brothers, or if he's just going to pick and choose a few movies to direct. There's even been talk that DC may go with this kind of, series of movies that don't interconnect where everybody can just kind of do their own thing and let directors and writers and actors do what brought them to the table and, and show off their talents in their own fashion, similarly to what DC did with Sean Murphy. So because of that, those reasons, I'm bullish on this series. This is a series that I'm going to be picking up and putting the set together. I will not wait for this one to get popular reader buzz. Um, remember, he brought in a, a first appearance in issue number three of the last series and that caused a cameo in two first full and three and that caused all those books to sell out who's to say the same kind of thing can't ha happen here i'm not going to wait and chase the market i'm going to get ahead of it this is a series i'm going to put together and again worst case scenario you can always do the dan piercy method lot them up as a set sell them to another reader who wants to get in on it who missed out on those first prints and is willing to pay a premium to get them Right, I've definitely been enjoying the Black Label, and like I've been saying, is whenever one was getting upset that Vertigo was going away, I think Black Label, the Black Label is like just another imprint where they can move a lot of those stories under if they wanted to. But yeah, they they can have those Vertigo titles where you get kind of that dark horror kind of occult R-rated feel, and then I love these R-rated takes on traditional superheroes. Plus, also, Brian, as we get older. I mean, we love comic books. We love our traditional superheroes. But we also want stories that appeal to us and our age demographic. And that's what DC Black Label is giving us. Um, they're giving us stories that, you know, it, it's not the campy Batman, for sure. We're getting that gritty, real kind of approach. And I, ho I think that that's something that all the other comic companies should take note of. We just talked about Ninja Turtles. There's talk about 
Eastman wanting a Netflix style Ninja Turtle series. IDW, I would love an, a more R rated comic book series yeah. to come out. Um, you know, so I think there's so much of those types of stories still left to be told on the market. I give DC a lot of credit for the foresight to do this Black Label series and, and the success that it's had. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to that. The Harleen book that's coming out. Me too. I think that's going to be really good. So. At the very least, the art will be fabulous. So there we have Jack's long-term play for this week. And that is also going to bring us to the end of our bolo list for the week. Right, Jack? Yep, that, that will conclude the list. So let us know what you guys think of the list. I mean, whether, I will say one thing. Sorry, I'm stumbling for words here. But there was one book that I wish was in the Reader Buzz section that wasn't, and that was Flash number 75. The finale to the year one story arc. But it doesn't have to be in the list for me to like it, so I'm, I'm fine with the list. But um, there, there, were some, there were some good ones. Flash number 75, Honor and Curse number six, yes. the conclusion of the epic tale from uh, Mad Cave Studios. Um, History of the Marvel Universe also had some people championing it. But again, guys, this is why you got to be talking about books, not on the day they release, yeah. in advance. Um, Flash 75 definitely had some some discussion of it. That one, I can, I can give Brian, I think probably maybe should have made the list. Um, History of the Marvel Universe, I didn't hear anyone talk about that book until the list came out today, and I heard a couple people say, why isn't that book on the list? Um, and then, um, what, what, what was the other one? What was the wrote? epilogue, the Marvel's epilogue with the Rose yeah. covers and stuff? Yeah, but. there was talk about that. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things, um, you know, you guys got to get out in front and let us know. That's why I follow so many of you with the Comic Book Invest CBSI account. I follow so many of you with the AKA Mr. Bolo account. I'm always paying attention to what people are talking about. I'm in those hashtags, especially new Comic Book Day discussion. Um, I know a lot of you out there produce your own Hot 10 lists or new Comic Book Day lists. I'm watching all those. I'm seeing what you guys are talking about. And that all that together Voltrons up and creates the Bolo list. Yeah. I like how I said Voltron and then do the Power Rangers reference. But <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, like I was saying before, let us know um, if there's other titles that you thought should be in the list as well. Because we're the guardians of the list. He just said that he makes the list off of what people, what he hears from people. And um, Jack, anything else before we go tonight? Again, just want to say shout out to everybody uh, in the chat. Um, I, I, in the chat, I can't say I've enjoyed it because I haven't done it yet. But the chat is always so exciting. Um, we love Simple Bits Comics family. I'm gonna put a plug out there one more time, even if Brian won't check out the Simple Bits Comics Patreon page for sure. Um, a lot of great discussion goes on in that Discord. Lots of information being shared. A lot of bolos being thrown around, not just by me, not just by Brian, but by the community. Uh, we are really trying to foster your community. And I'll say, <coughs> excuse me, stay tuned for what we have planned for the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. There's a lot going on behind the scenes, a lot in the works. We want to bring to you the most exciting and the hottest content on the market and the best CBSI content possible. And we have so many plans coming forward uh, down the pike. So if you're not subscribed... If you're checking out, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you get that notification. Hit that bell. And again, if you appreciate our contact content, if you like what we do, uh, please like the video. It really helps us out, gets the video more visible. And uh, we appreciate everybody who tuned in tonight. Right. So, yeah, I just need to clone myself between working full-time and working on here. We'll get the content out. Um, and that would be scary because I, I just picture myself being like, what was it, the seventh clone in Multiplicity with – I want pizza, Steve. I want pizza. Yeah. That's why. That's why we're counting down the days till Brian can put in his retirement papers. But till then, yeah, we have to be careful not to burn Brian out. But again, appreciate all you guys for watching. Even if you're watching on the replay, really means a lot to us. Um, love the community. We're not just saying that. We're building a really good community here, and that's what. Like, it really hurts to have to premiere this tonight because I'm not being able to participate in the chat during the live show that's one of the things that i look forward to and we'll be honest i get distracted from sometimes because i'm in there chatting but thank you guys for watching we will be live again next thursday 9 p.m eastern and you guys have a good night